Welcome to the How to Quit Working Show. This is the only show that brings you awesome people just like you who got sick and tired of doing something they don't like and don't care about and have created an amazing life of freedom using what they know instead of just getting paid for what they do. And now, here's your host, the Quit Working Guy, Jeff Steinman. Hello everyone, welcome to the How to Quit Working Show. Today, I've got a little bit different show for you. Actually, I would say it's a lot different. We talk to a lot of people on this show about creating a business and doing something with their life that they really care about, they really love, and they're passionate about. But today, we're going to get a different perspective on that. Today, I've asked Jim Beach to join us. Now, Jim has started multiple multi-million dollar businesses as well as taught business and entrepreneurship as a university professor, and today he is going to give us a different perspective than what we normally talk about on this show about creating a business and about what it really takes to be a successful entrepreneur. Jim, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Jim, I'm excited to have you here because you have a different perspective about entrepreneurship and what it means to be an entrepreneur and more importantly, what it takes to be an entrepreneur. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you're, you're right, Jeff. I really do think that my view is a little bit different. You know, if we were to play Family Feud, Jeff, and we were to have <laughs> the top three answers on the board to what is entrepreneurship, I'm pretty sure the top three answers would be creativity, risk, and passion. And I believe that those are the three things that are holding people back from being the successful entrepreneurs that they want to be. There's these myths out there about entrepreneurship. People think that only creative people can be entrepreneurs, and I think that's 100% wrong. People think that you have to take a lot of risk to be an entrepreneur, and I think that it's actually the other way around. Entrepreneurs are people who figure out how to reduce risk to the point where it's a no-brainer. And more importantly, and this is the most important thing, Jeff, Passion is bad. I don't believe in passion at all. I am not passionate about my entrepreneur uh, activities. I'm not passionate about the goods and the products that I sell. I am, however, very passionate about the process, the freedom, the fact that I don't work for the man, the fact that I eat what I kill, the fact that I am in control of my destiny. But, Jeff, I don't care what I do. I don't care what I sell. As long as I get to go to Disney two weeks a year with what I am passionate about, which is my three beautiful children and my incredible wife, I'll do almost any entrepreneurial activity if it means that I have the freedom to do what I'll, you know, the other things that I want. And that's what I think the beauty of entrepreneurship is, is that it allows me to go to ballet at two soccer at four and then say, Hey, I'm done for the day. I'm quitting. You know, I, I love that uh, expression that entrepreneurs can work any 27 hours of the day that they want to (laughs) and that they have that freedom. But, you know, it is true. I work very, very hard as an entrepreneur, Mm -hmm. but I also have more freedom than any of my friends. I spend more time with my children than any of my friends because of the entrepreneurship lifestyle that I've been able to create for myself. And You know, I love your blogs, Jeff, I was looking through some of the things that you've been writing about. You know, I, I really uh, agree. and I'm so happy to, to have met you because I think you and I are real kindred spirits in this sense. Yeah. You know, people can be entrepreneurs with never having had a creative thought in their body. You know, they don't have to uh, have this inspiration, this lightning bolt from God, Yahweh, Buddha, Muhammad, whoever. You know, you can just go on Mr. Google and type in free business ideas for under $500. And I think the the listeners would be blown away by how many hundreds of business plans are online that people are giving away. You know, the opportunities, the ideas are out there. It's really easy to find a, a problem to go solve. And I love that definition of entrepreneurship is solving problems with limited budgets. Mm-hmm. That's, to me, a really cool defini- definition of entrepreneurship because it embodies what, you know, what I want to say that you don't have to be passionate about this. You know, I will sell anything that's legal if I can go to Disney an extra week of the year because of it. And so my views, I think, are a little bit different on entrepreneurship, but it's really empowering 
for one of the 72% of Americans who claim they want to be an entrepreneur. So 72% Jeff want to be, 10% are. So we're looking at 60% that are sitting on the sofa mm -hmm. because they're afraid of creativity, risk, or passion. They, you know, we hear excuses like, well, I can't be an entrepreneur right now, Jeff, because you know, my boys are about to go off to college. And now's a bad time for mm -hmm. me to take this risk. Mm -hmm. you know, I hear that a thousand. Or uh, I'm just waiting you know, as soon as I get my inspiration. As soon as I find a cool business for me to start, well, I'm going to jump right in with both feet. Mm -hmm. Just as soon as God gives me an idea, well, mm -hmm. that person will die sitting on the sofa, remote in hand, with no business to ever run. So, Jim, your, your advice for, the, for that guy, for that person who's in that situation is just find an opportunity. doesn't matter if you like it or not, and, and push forward with that opportunity. Is, is that what you're saying? Yes. You know, I, I am, I do love what I do and I don't want to dismiss passion. I'm very fortunate that I love being on the radio with you, Jeff, and I appreciate yeah. talking and I love writing the book and talking about it and stuff like that. But I'd rather be at Disney World right now. You know, I really would. I love being with you, but I'd rather be at <laughs> Disney. And Fair enough. Yeah, you know, I'll be honest with you. Yeah. Uh, I like you a lot, but my kids and my wife, my wife is better looking than you, thank goodness. That's and, a good thing for you. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and so, you know, when we talk about all of these things, uh, people assume that they have to do the business that they are passionate about because everyone says, you know, if you find a business that you're passionate about, you'll never work another day in your life. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not true either. You know, and I'll tell you what I'm passionate about in the real world, other than the, the ethereal, you know, the love that I have. I also love woodworking. Mm. I, I love woodworking. Nothing makes me happier than going into the shop and making a piece of furniture and carrying it into the home to people tell me how beautiful it is and how beautiful it makes my home. Yeah. Well, I built, I built a bench about a year ago and I carried it into my home and my, two of my children sat on it and it collapsed. Oh, Jeff, no. I'm not very good at building furniture. I love it, but ah. I'm not very good at it. I can't make a living that allows me to go to Disney two weeks a year as a furniture builder. Mm -hmm. I just can't do it. So I had to realize that, you know what, the things I'm passionate about are great things to be passionate about on Saturday and Sunday or on Friday afternoon when I have some free time mm -hmm. because I have free time as an entrepreneur. But I also had to realize, you know what, overall, the basket of goods that I want out of life, I want this and I want this house and this car and these trips and these opportunities for my children. Well, if that's what I want, I realized that I had to do something to make money. And so all of us make that decision. We go get jobs as doctors and lawyers and accountants because, you know, we, we sort of like doing those things, but we understand that that's how we can support our families in a really nice lifestyle. And so yeah. we make those sacrifices. Well, wouldn't it be cool if we could still supply our family with all of those opportunities, but do it in a way that's not quite as horrible as being an accountant or not quite as morally <laughs> quite offensive as, as being a lawyer, you know? <laughs> I mean, or not quite as dangerous and scary as being a doctor right yeah. now. I know a lot of doctors, Jeff, and they're scared to death yeah. about their debt. They still have $100,000 in medical school bills to pay off. You know, these are people who are really afraid. I'm afraid too, but you know what? I'm in control mm -hmm. at least. Mm -hmm. At least I can control my destiny a little more. Yeah, yeah. But now, so, so Jim, you, you said you have businesses that while you enjoy the process of running them, you enjoy the entrepreneurial process, you enjoy the outcome of them, you don't really care that much about the businesses. So how, how do you keep yourself moving forward? Because one of the things that I tell entrepreneurs is, you know what, if you don't like – actually, the way I say it is entrepreneurship is too hard to do something that you don't like. Or, or that you don't care about. So how, how, do you, how, how do you keep it interesting and how do you keep yourself engaged and involved selling, I don't know, wedding dresses or some, something completely off the wall that just doesn't get you excited? 
Well, you know, I, right now I'm involved in a real estate website. Okay. And in my opinion, I think the last thing the world needs is another real estate website, you know? <laughs> <laughs> or conversely, the, need, or the world needs a lot of new real estate websites. <laughs> you know, so it's not my passion. You know, I'm not waking up in the morning excited to do this. Uh -huh. But, you know, when I do wake up in the morning, I have a two-year-old baby crying from his crib saying, Daddy, Daddy. And I have a 15-year-old son, and my 15-year-old son says, Disney, Disney. <laughs> uh, it's easy enough to program your brain to think of the work that I have to go do today as simply work. I mean, again, those people who are you know, uh, garbage men and doctors and accountants and stuff, they have the same thing. They get up and they don't necessarily love going to work, but they do it. And that's what adults do. You know, I mean, adults do stuff we don't like to do. We go and get colonoscopies, Jeff, because we're told we have to do it. We don't enjoy that process. Well, maybe some people do, but <laughs> most of us don't enjoy that. So, you know, when I get up in the morning and I have nothing but real estate work to do all day, I simply say to myself, by working all day on this real estate stuff, I get to go on Space Mountain three yeah. times. You know, and so I've trained myself to realize I'm not going to enjoy the next three hours. It's not going to be unbearable. I'm not doing anything that I despise doing, you mm -hmm. know, Jeff. Mm -hmm. I'm not out there digging ditches yeah. in the hot Georgia sun in our clay. You know, I, I do have limits to what I will do. <laughs> but on the other hand, I can bear through three or four hours of unpleasant work. I know that after lunch, I have a cool meeting on a topic I do like, and I'll look forward to that so mm -hmm. the day's not a complete waste. I'm really looking forward to dinner with my family tonight because we're going to talk about their baseball game that I was able to see. You know, as adults, we do stuff we don't like. And so I think that part of being an entrepreneur is saying, you know what, I'm willing to do some of the stuff I don't like because I've decided that making money and controlling my own destiny is more important than four hours of work. I can mm -hmm. sit down and be mature for four hours and do something that I don't necessarily enjoy because I am an adult. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's what when we raise children, we teach them. You have to stand in line for an hour. I'm sorry. That's just the way it's going to work. We're yeah. here. We're going to stand in line. And no, you don't get a cell phone for an hour to play games. We're just going to stand here and talk and be bored, mm -hmm. you know, because that's <laughs> the way it is, you know. And yeah. it's part of being a, you know, a mature entrepreneur. I've been an entrepreneur that only did the stuff I like. But you know what? Every once in a while as entrepreneurs, we will get opportunities to do businesses that I sit there, or anyone would sit there and look at it and go, you're right. This is a good opportunity. Someone is going to make $5 million doing this. Mm -hmm. Well, it might as well be me. You know? <laughs> sure. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm sitting here with this opportunity in front of me. I am honest enough to say I'm not going to love every second. I'm not going to despise every second. But that goal of $5 million and the freedom that that allows it. How many times could I go to Disney for, for $5, uh, $5 million? You know, I, I would hope that people are in control of their emotions and their passions and their ac actions enough that they could say, I'm going to sacrifice right now for the good of my family, for the good of my fiscal well-being. Right now, I'm going to work really hard so that when I'm 75, I don't have to. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, so, so Jim, you obviously haven't always had this mentality, right? No, I, I not at all. This okay. is something that I've developed in my post-divorce. I went through a divorce because of entrepreneurship. Mm. I was in the hospital for a very long time. Mm. Uh, um, I, uh, I've been $8 million in debt and uh, got out of that hole. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I feel like I have had some life experiences. And through those, I've learned that, you know what, we do things in life we don't like, like going to the hospital. Yeah. But that gives us the opportunity to do the things that we do love, mm. like, like being with my wife, my new beautiful wife. You know, these are the, the things that we live for. And so, 
No, I, my first business that I did, Jeff, I started when I was 25. I loved every second of it. I was lucky. It was a, a business that I could be passionate about. Uh-huh. And, and I was fortunate. But then after I sold that business and I was looking at new opportunities, I saw opportunities that didn't necessarily appeal to me as a, a person, but appealed to me as a, a person who cares about their bank account. Mm, mm-hmm. So what made you decide to pursue those opportunities when you had already had a taste of how much fun it's like, how much fun it is and what it's like to do something that you really enjoy? Well, it was 2001 mm-hmm. and I didn't have any other ideas. You uh-huh. know, this was the idea on the table. This was the model in front of me. The opportunity was there and I, I had a choice, do something that I'm not in love with or do nothing and continue to wait. Hmm. And that's the choice that the people listening today have. They can do nothing or slightly acquiesce to the reality of the situation, whatever their situation is, and they can say, you know, I do want to be an entrepreneur, but I don't have a great idea yet. So what I'm going to do is go to Inc. Magazine Find something that's really working well in Seattle, and I'm going to do it here in wherever I live. I'm just going to do it and execute it better than mm. anyone else. You know, so that's the decision I had to make. Sit on the sidelines mm. or at least be in the game. You know, it's not my favorite game, but at least I was playing. So do you want to sit and not play, or would you rather get in the game and be one of the players, even if it's not your favorite you know, your favorite game. I don't want to be, uh, I, I want to be quarterback, but I still want to go in the game. Even if you're going to put me in as halfback, mm-hmm, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, so you're, you're kind of saying to find an, an, an existing model that works and, and replicate that. And uh, my question for you is Jim, if it's that easy, then why aren't, why aren't more people doing it? I, I, it's these three myths. People are afraid of the risk. They don't think they're creative, and they hear this idea that they have to be passionate. And so they sit waiting mm-hmm. for an idea to strike them that they can do for free that mm-hmm. they're passionate about. Well, mm-hmm. that doesn't happen. Ideas do not fall into your lap that you can execute for free with zero risk that you're passionate about. That does not happen. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Well, it's never happened to me. Maybe it's happened to you, Jeff, but I haven't been that lucky yet. And so... Those are the people who sit on the sofa and die holding the remote as opposed to die holding the paperwork for their LLC. You know, so, you know, it's about compromise. Let me ask you this. Did you marry Heidi Klum? I did not. I did not either. I did not marry the most beautiful woman in the world. (laughs) I married the third most beautiful woman in the world. I had to compromise. Uh You know, I mean, I hate to be so crass about it. Uh, we all make compromises in life. You know, I would like to live at the top of that mountain in that biggest house up there, but I don't. I had to buy this one down here at the bottom of the hill because that's what I could afford. We make compromises in life all the time in every part of our life, in our love life, in our activities, our vacations, everything. So what's wrong with making a little bit of a compromise and saying, you know what, this isn't my dream business. My dream business was to own the world's largest airline. Mm. Well, that's just not realistic. You know, Mm. as a starting entrepreneur, I can't do that. So what's wrong with owning the world's best travel agency Mm. in, in Durham, North Carolina? What's wrong with having the absolute best travel agency in Durham, North Carolina? There's nothing wrong with that. And let me list some some companies, and I'll make my point after I give you the list, Adidas, Nike, Hyatt, Hilton, McDonald's, Burger King, you know, Zestos, Chick-fil-A, you know, there are many, 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 many incredible companies that we would all be ecstatic to own that are absolutely nothing but me too copycat businesses. Mm. 93%, Jeff, of the businesses around the world are copies of other businesses. That data comes from the London School of Economics from their Global Entrepreneurship Monitor. So if 93% of the businesses are copies, what's wrong with me copying Mm. a business? Mm -hmm. You know, I have to do something new and original. No, you don't. 
Adidas, Nike, Hyatt, Hilton, Marriott. What's wrong with doing another pet food store? I'm going to operate the best pet daycare in Atlanta, by God. We're going to have the best service. We're going to have innovative things to do. We're going to have doggy treats at 2 in the afternoon. No one else does that. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're just going to do it better. I don't care if it's new and creative. All I want to be is in control of my own destiny. I I, I just want to get in the game. So you tell me some rules, I'm going to go play the game. I don't care if it's my favorite game or not. Mm. So, so you made, you made an interesting point. You said do it better. Do you have to do it better in every in every single way? I mean, do you have to be better at every single aspect of that company than say McDonald's. If I was going to be the next fast food sensation, no, you know, I, no, uh, it's. It's great when you can do a lot of different things better, mm. but I think there's really good examples where one or a company says we're going to do one or two things better and that's all. For example, Southwest Airlines, you know, they don't charge for baggage like everyone else in the world now. If you actually, you know, have a piece of luggage, they're not going to charge you for that's it. That's why I fly Southwest. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, there's other reasons, but that's one of the big ones. Okay, there you go. It's that simple. They have found one way to differentiate themselves from everyone else. So my first business, Jeff, was in summer camping. There's nothing more less sexy than summer camp, right? <laughs> sure. Except that we grew it to a $15 million a year business with 700 employees. That's sexy. Wow. But here's the difference that I made at the very, very beginning. We ran a commuter program and an overnight program. Every commuter program in America stops at 3 o'clock, okay? Our commuter program stopped at 9 o'clock at night, Mm. which meant that mom and dad could go get dinner, go on a date, and then pick the kid up on the way home who would then fall asleep on the car ride home. Mom and dad truly got the day off. And our business thrived because of that one differentiation. We said, we're going to make this easy for you. The whole point of you sending your kid to camp was to get rid of the kid so that you could have an easier day or week or month. And we're going to make that even easier by not requiring you to get off work at 2.30 to come home and get the kid for two hours. We're going to make it even so that you can go to dinner with your beautiful wife. That's how easy we're going to make it for you. That's all we did different. That's it. Yeah, and and why did you do that different as opposed to something like maybe having different activities for the kids or what have you? Well, you know, we did do some of those things too, and we were at better locations, the more convenient mm. locations. But, you know, I had overnight students that I had to take care of 24 hours a day, right? And mm. when mm-hmm. the commuters leave, the room is half as exciting as it just was, oh, okay. right? And so it made sense for me to have the kids there, too, because that gives me a more fun capture the flag game. Would you rather play capture uh-huh. the flag with 20 kids or 50 kids? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so it was just a better experience, and we quickly realized, hey, this is something we can do for the parents. We did do other things, too. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not – that wasn't our only thing okay. that we – hard to do, but it was just one of the things, and it was one of the things that I could tell a parent that would immediately appeal to them because they just got six hours more for the same price. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and I think one of the key aspects is there is that you knew what your customer wanted. You understood what your customer's life was like and what would really help them out and give them a better experience. Well, that's entirely what that business did. That I, I, there's a lot more that, to that business I haven't told you yet. It was a technology summer camp. It was not sports related at all. Oh, okay. So most of our customers were dorky, unhappy kids. <laughs> okay. uh, I'll be honest. I yeah. was. Exactly I was. I was one way. of those kids. So. And right. And so imagine this, Jeff. Uh, we would get letters from parents who said, my child had not smiled in two years. Your camp made my child smile Aww. for the first time in two years. And so, you know, we were doing great things and providing great services, but, uh, you know, it wasn't anything creative, unique, or compelling. You know, we just did it really well, yeah. you know. Yeah. We worked hard, and we made a list. And let's, make, let's talk about a bookstore. Let's take a generic bookstore. How could we make 
a generic bookstore better? If you made a list of every single aspect, how easy is it to get into the parking lot? How close are the parking spaces to the front door? How easy is the front door to open? What is the smell that you encounter when you walk into the bookstore? Yeah. Does it smell like coffee or baked goods or old rotting books. How helpful is the staff? You know, there's a thousand different ways you could make that bookstore better. What if you took the Disney example and went out and gave the parking lot names? Like, here's the Shakespeare section, and here's the, you know, the uh, Alexander Dumas section, and here's the Tom Wolfe section. I mean, does it make the uh, parking any easier? No, but it makes the store 0.1% cuter, sexier, because they took the effort to name their parking spaces after authors. Mm, mm -hmm, I mean, is it mm -hmm. really better? No, but it, there is a perceived value there. You know, these, this bookstore owner cares enough to put a Shakespeare picture in the parking lot. Yeah. You know, for some reason, one of the uh, a famous Atlanta story jumped to mind. Uh, in 1978, there was a famous Atlanta snowstorm, and it closed the city. Okay. And there was one restaurant that stayed open and served almost all of the good part of Atlanta. Mm. And it was a one plate, one chain, a guy running one restaurant, and that restaurant was about to go out of business, but because he stayed open during that storm, he endeared himself so much to the community mm. that he started to expand. That's now called Longhorn Steaks, and there's 3,500 of them in the United States. The, oh, first wow. one, the first one started and stayed open, Jeff, because he was open during a snowstorm when no one else was. And now we have 3,500 Longhorn Steaks because of it. And they make a good steak there. I love a Longhorn. Yeah. I love a Longhorn. And George Macaro, the owner, the founder, is an amazing, an amazing man who did an amazing thing. He stayed at that restaurant for seven days in a row and cooked steaks for seven days in a row so people in Atlanta could have food during the storm. Wow. And that's all it took. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, so Jim, let's talk about this person who is, who is on the couch with the remote waiting for – the right idea to come along or the inspiration from their higher power or whatever it may be, they're, they're waiting. What, what are a couple of, of first steps that you would give them or things that you would have them do if they came to you and they said, Jim, okay, I'm tired of all this BS that I'm hearing. I'm on board with what you're saying. Tell, tell me what the heck to do. Well, can I make the case a little bit more extreme, Jeff? Yeah, I, I, I wish you would. Yeah, let me kick it up a notch. So, Somewhere in the, my book, I, I wrote that anyone can be an entrepreneur. I, it's on page 68 or 112 or something like that. Okay. And so the phone rang two months ago, and it was a young man, 26 years old, and he called and was like, Jim, I only have five minutes to talk. And I was like, fine. He's, uh, I am uh, just got out of jail. I'm in rehab right now for my heroin addiction. I'm bipolar and schizophrenic. Um, but I want to be an entrepreneur. Can you help? Mm -hmm. Your book says anyone can be an entrepreneur. I'm going to test that. And that person is now a business owner two months later and has already started making money. Wow. Already making money. Uh, is the business they're doing is the least sexy thing on earth. If I were to tell you what it was, you'd be like, oh, that's not so cool. Except that a bipolar, schizophrenic, heroin addict who just got out of jail is now doing it and making money two months later. Wow. Okay. Wow. So, you know, for me, the first step is something a little motivational. You know, I want you to put the remote down. I want to tell you a couple motivational stories. I want to tell you about my friend that I just mentioned who stepped forward. I want to tell you about my wife. On December 26th, so six, seven months ago, my wife, I challenged her to start a business. Mm. And she started a business for under $100 and is now making about $5,000 a month uh, top line and probably about $1,500 a month profit. Okay. Six months later, having $100 to start with. Wow. It's been amazing to watch her self-esteem explode, to watch her self-confidence 
And now she's starting to have ideas for other businesses that she wants to start. Mm -hmm. So I would take this person, this imaginary sofa sitter, and say, let's start off with the simplest, easiest business that we can think of to do nothing but build your self-confidence, to show Mm -hmm. you that you can do it. And you might not find the business to be sexy, but what is sexy is that you're changing your life. You know, mm-hmm. are you willing to do something kind of boring if it will change your life forever? Most people are going to say yes to that. Yeah. And so I want to start off with, I call it the snowflake principle. We don't build a snowman except by packing millions of individual snowflakes together. Our life is millions of millions of opportunities for us to Be proud of ourselves. Every time we achieve something, we add yet another snowflake to our self-esteem, to our confidence level, to our snowman. And that gives you the power at 70 years old to walk into a room with people who are going to yell at you and not be nervous. Mm -hmm. It gives you the confidence to walk into a sales meeting and know that you're going to do well because you have millions of snowflakes, millions of times, tiny little accomplishments. Mm -hmm. So if my two-year-old son... If he can uh, hold the flashlight correctly, because we didn't have power last night, and he's holding the flashlight correctly, I praise him for doing that Mm -hmm. so that we can build his little snowflakes. Mm. And the same thing is true with this man, this sofa sitter. Let's do something to get you motivated. Let's take baby steps, Mm. absolutely baby steps. Are you willing today to take the risk to go online and get your federal ID number, your federal social security number for your business? Mm. It's going to take you six minutes. It's not going to cost you a penny. Are you willing to do that today? Oh, you are. Oh, okay, let's go do it together. Oh, we're done now. Wow, there's a snowflake for you. You know what? You are started. Tomorrow we're going to take the next step. And tomorrow's step is going to be 1% harder than today's step. But you're able to do it. You accomplished today. Can you do something 1% harder tomorrow? Oh, you can. You're willing to try. Oh, well, fantastic. I'll be back here tomorrow, and we'll do that thing together. And lo and behold, these people, by taking small baby steps. You know, I'm not trying to start, Jeff, a billion-dollar business. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to start a business that makes $1,000. That's a different goal. Mm -hmm. You know, starting a million-dollar business sounds pretty daunting. sounds kind of scary. Yeah. Starting a business that makes $1,000... Oh, I can do that. Yeah. That's not, I can handle that. And then you know what? Well, now our goal is to make that $1,000 to $2,000. Mm-hmm. That's all our goal is. So small little baby steps. We're not going to jump into the deep end of the pool. You know, we're going to put you in a life jacket and put you in the shallow end first. Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, you know, let's work together on your motivation. Let's work on your self-confidence and your self-esteem. And let's go do these baby steps together. Um, there are... 4,000 products online that will baby step you through how to go start, for example, an Amazon business. Mm. So my wife's business is, it's not sexy at all. She buys stuff at wholesale Mm -hmm. and then sends it to Amazon and Amazon sells it for her and then sends her a check. Mm. There is nothing sexy about that at all except that six months ago, she was not a business owner. Today she is, and today she's making $1,500 a month in profit. Mm. That's sexy. Yeah. If I told you that she's selling baby supplements and uh, silver polish on Amazon, you're like, oh, <laughs> that's not very sexy. Right. Except that she's making $1,500 a month after six months. Yeah. You know? That's sexy. Her goal is to get it up to $3,000 a month so that she can pay our mortgage. You know, if all of a sudden your mortgage disappears out of your family's life, Mm -hmm. that's called sexy. Yeah. You know, that's changed. That changes your life forever. That's $3,000 a month that you can put into savings or education or growing another business, whatever it is, $3,000 a month can change your family forever. Yeah, sure. Sure. And that's sexy enough to make the most boring Amazon business sexy, sexy. Yeah. When I, and Jim, you, you mentioned you have a couple of kids, right? Three. Okay. So isn't it – so a lot of our listeners have kids, and, and I think that one of the things that, that folks are, are, are afraid of is, is, is the risk that comes with entrepreneurship when you have – 
those mouths to feed and those and those kids who you love very much and are very dependent upon you. What 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 what's your advice for those kind of those folks? Well, I'm going to I'm going to go back and continue talking about my wife. In the 6 months that she started since she started this business, she has still cooked dinner for us uh 5 nights out of 7. Our baby is still clean. Mm -hmm. Our house is still clean. She made cookies for me two nights ago because she had extra time, and she knows that I like it when she makes cookies. <laughs> Our sex life has not suffered. Uh -huh. Our life has not changed, Jeff. She's able to do this in four or five hours a week, so she's not reading as much leisure activity as she used to. Mm -hmm. She given up one of her hobbies, but our life has not changed. She still works a full-time job. She still gets up in the morning, goes to work at 8, comes home at 6, takes care of me, takes care of the baby, and is running a business on the side, too. Oh, wow. She works a full-time job as well. She works a full-time job. And I promise you, taking care of me, Jeff, is also a full-time job. I can imagine. Much more difficult <laughs> than the babies. Uh and she's able to do it all. You know, it's, it's about a little bit of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. She has given up one hour a day of casual reading. Mm -hmm. You know, from 10 until 11, she doesn't watch TV. She likes to read trashy novels. Mm -hmm. And she's not doing that now. Instead, she's devoted one hour a day to her Amazon business. Mm -hmm. And you talk about risk. There's been no risk in our life. Mm -hmm. There was no there was no incremental pain in our life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you want to go start a business, I, I kind of think that this excuse that I already have a job is a pretty weak one. Mm. You know, and I, I say this, I'm going to tell, say something facetiously right now, but I say it with a little bit of seriousness. Uh -huh. All entrepreneurs should take up smoking. Okay. <laughs> so that you can take a 15-minute smoke break every other hour so that you can go outside and make telephone calls for your business. Ah, <laughs> I don't really want you smoking and I don't want you to quit your day job until your boss has come to you three or four times and said, you're doing something else, aren't you? you I've just, over the last year, I've noticed you've become more distracted and you're, you're doing something outside of work, aren't you? And you finally admit to it a year later. Yeah, I started a little business on the side. I, uh, I, I own a pet grooming business, a mobile pet grooming business, and I have two guys out there, and um, I groom pets all day Saturday and Sunday. Well, you're fired. Okay, fine. I don't care now because I spent the last two years building this business. It's now strong enough to support me. Yeah. yeah. So don't go quit your day job until you get your butt fired. Okay. And I, I, I say that a little facetiously, but I'm also being a little serious. Yeah. I want you to take two-hour lunches. I want you to, you know, if, if you have a day job, I recommend you keep it for the benefits and the health insurance. But come home at 6, and instead of turning the television on, you sit down and uh, work. We, we have had nights at our house, Jeff, where every single child, including the two-year-old baby, has helped us package Amazon stuff <laughs> for sale. You know, what's wrong with making, hey, it's family night. We're all going to sticker mommy's boxes tonight <laughs> so that she can sell stuff. What's wrong with making a 15 and a 13 and a two-year-old work? Sure, sure. You know? And so uh, I believe that, you know, if you sacrifice some of the things, you know, if you sacrifice sports, for example, men, I don't understand, and I don't, I hope you're not one of these guys who watches every single game all weekend long. Oh, no. I don't get it. I don't watch sports because I don't have time because I'm stickering stuff mm. or I'm working and then this is the time I'm going to spend with my child and my child doesn't want to sit here and watch sports. You know, yeah. we want to go play sports together. Yeah. We want to go swimming together. We don't want to watch someone swim. Yeah. So uh, it's about sacrifices. I have given up a lot of stuff that I enjoy because I enjoy freedom and prosperity more, mm -hmm. you know? Sure. I enjoy knowing that I'm not, you know, I, I, I know where we're going to get our food tomorrow. I yeah. like that, you know? So uh, if you're sitting on the sofa, 
it's about putting the remote control down, taking your right hand, you put it right up over your head, like two feet over your head, foot and a half over your head, you put your right hand there, and then you say, I am now an entrepreneur. Mm. That's all you do. That's the first step. And then the second step is you get your butt off the sofa, and you go sit down in front of Mr. Google, and you type in free business ideas. Idea, business plans for free. My book had 40 businesses at the back in the appendix that we were giving away for free. Go start this business for free. You know, because you can make a living doing this business. You can support a family doing this business. It won't cost you more than $500 to start. Mm. Mm. There's a million businesses out there like that to go do. What if I fail? What's wrong? Who cares? I mean, this is America. This is not Japan. You know, in Japan, you're allowed one chance, and after that, you're not allowed another chance. I was $8 million in debt. No one holds that against me. Mm. You know, people don't look down on me because I failed in America. Mm -hmm. People don't care. If you fail in America, how many times has Donald Trump been bankrupt? Mm -hmm. I, by my count, like three or four now. Yeah. I, do we think less of Donald Trump? No. Not because of that. No, well, <laughs> well, you think less of him because of his hair. Exactly. <laughs> and the, the craziness. But still, America loves the comeback story. Yeah. You know, America loves that. If you go into an entrepreneurial event and if you were to walk around and say, how many of you have had financial troubles that you lived through? Most of the entrepreneurs there have had some financial difficulties. Mm -hmm. And I'll even, I'll be crazy enough to say this, Jeff. If you haven't been bankrupt or come really close as an entrepreneur, you're not trying hard enough. <laughs> you're not pushing the envelope hard sure. enough. You know? Sure. So in America, if you fail, we, we dust ourselves off, we get up, and we go try again. That's one of the two or three greatest things about America, in my opinion, is that you're allowed to go try again. Sure, sure, sure. Well, Jim, so how, how do you raise your children in a different way than that guy sitting on the couch with the remote control or somebody who's maybe not that extreme of a case, maybe somebody uh, who's kind of more in the middle. But cl clearly you want to pass this mentality and this lifestyle onto your children. So what do you do with them? How do you, how do you parent them differently to ensure that they end up as, as, as business savvy and, and with the awesome lifestyle that you have? Well, my father taught me, and I respect what my parents did so much. We talk about business at dinner. Mm. You know, we talk about uh, things. They go to meetings with me hmm. uh, all the time. My children frequently go to meetings with me. Uh, I, as a matter of fact, a month and a half ago, a ex-client, ex-student of mine called and said, Jim, I would like you to meet my new CEO. And, you know, it's a casual thing. And I was like, fine. I showed up with a two-year-old baby in T-shirt. Uh -huh. And they had 12 people there. They had rented a conference room. People had flown in from around the country to meet me. And I showed up with a two-year-old baby. They looked at me like, oh, my God, this man is insane. Well, the, it was a 90-minute meeting. The baby didn't speak once. Uh -huh. uh, the baby was perfect because it wasn't the baby's first rodeo. The uh -huh. baby knows how to shake hands. The baby's been going to meetings since it was six weeks old, uh -huh. literally. You know, uh, the baby knew what to do. They, at the end, they commented more on how well-behaved the baby was than how smart I was. I got hired because the baby was so good. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, my children, my older children, go and watch me lecture. Uh, I used to be a professor, and I would make my children, who, I made my son when he was five, stand up in front of my MBA class that I was teaching and tell the MBA class what we had done that day simply so that he could get experience talking in front of people and not learn to be nervous about it. Oh, and now awesome. he's an amazing communicator. My children are intimately involved in my businesses. They know what I'm doing. They know that I have a bad week. I tell them I had a bad week. This mm -hmm. is what happened. Mm -hmm. And I tell them I had a bad week because daddy's ego allowed him to get mad. Uh -huh. Daddy did something stupid because I got mad at someone and yelled at someone. Uh -huh. And boy, am I embarrassed now. And now I have to go apologize to this person. And I hate apologizing, and they know that. And so, you know, I, 
It's about being honest with them and helping them live through the experience. You know, what's wrong with taking them to look at a piece of land to decide whether to buy it or not? Yeah, that's awesome. You know, I mean, so my children have been involved from day one. Um, and it's simply because that's the way I was raised as well. My parents involved me at, at the earliest age possible. I remember going with my parents to look at things, going to auctions and bidding on furniture that I was buying for my bedroom when I was nine. Mm. You know, I mean, their money, but they let me do the bidding, you know? Oh, that's awesome. Um, and that's the same thing with my kids. I want them to be involved. I want them to hear the conversations I'm having, and I don't shelter them from too much of the good or the bad. That's awesome. It's a very different perspective, you know, because when I was growing up, it was about, you know, there's adult things and there's kid things, and they're totally separate. Well, how do the kids learn about the adult things if the adults don't show them? Exactly, exactly. And why, what's wrong? You know, there's different versions. I tell my 13-year-old daughter a different version of the story than I tell my 15-year-old son because they're emotionally, mentally, mm. physically capable of handling different things. Yeah. My daughter cries, mm -hmm. okay? So I don't tell her the things that are going to make her cry. Aww. I'll tell that part to my son, uh -huh. you know? It's just different, you yeah. know? Each child you have to treat differently, but treat them, you know, as, you know, they are, they're smart. They're, they're smart enough to listen. They're probably listening when you don't think they are. You might as well include them so they feel like they're part of it. Sure. They love it when they get invited to go to see me give a speech. Yeah. They, that makes them so happy yeah. because you know, they feel proud. And, uh, you know, I have a, a radio show that I do as well, and I had my daughter on the show the other day. She was sitting in my lap during the introductions, uh -huh. you know, and I had her <laughs> talk into the microphone. And the second she got done, she tweeted all of her friends about it and said, listen to me on the radio with my daddy, you Aww. know. That, that's one of her snowflakes. Yeah. You know, that yeah. makes her think she's cool. That makes her know that she's good enough to be on the radio. She's been on the radio before. If someone, you know, she does something and says, will you come and talk about your product, your cool new business on the radio? She'll be like, sure, I've been doing that since I was 13. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Jim, what would you say is the biggest mistake that you've made on this journey? Oof. Well, gosh, I've made a lot. I mean, I don't, we're going to have to have a whole nother hour, Jeff. Uh, as I said, you know, I've been $8 million in debt. I've been very, very, very sick. Uh, I have had doctors tell me that they were going to go get me a hospital room. And while they leave the, uh, my, you know, the examining room, I put my clothes back on and sneak out of the door mm. because I have a meeting with a venture capitalist or a banker. Mm -hmm. Um, I, my health, I've, uh, I've, taken very poor care of my health mm. and because of that I've had you know some surgeries and stuff like that um, and that was my biggest mistake uh, other than that just not pushing hard enough mm. you know I sit back and go gosh I could have grown that business faster mm. I should have ah that one was a one million it should have been a five million dollar mm. business you know uh, I wish I'd started sooner you know I wish that I knew now what I you know or could have known then, I wish, you know, that I could uh, tell myself 20 years ago, there's nothing wrong with failure, there's nothing wrong with pushing, you know, sure. if people laugh at you, you don't care, you know, uh, the check's still cashed. Um, I would tell myself, you know, instead of starting when you're 25, start when you're 15, you know, and I would throw away the television, I would have, you know, I wouldn't have gone off and bought that new TV that yeah. I bought. Yeah. Um, because, you know, I'm working really hard right now. I haven't watched TV in the last two months. Um, and it's because of my work schedule right now. Yeah. And I don't miss it. You know, I'm not missing it. I'm not sitting there, God, darn, I just missed the news. Yeah. Oh, I'm not okay. saying that. So, so I, I, I wish I had just tried harder and pushed harder. And maybe that's the message I would like to give everyone else, a very motivational message. You can do it. Let me say this, Jeff. I am not a smart person. I'm not a good-looking person. I'm not skilled at anything. I'm able to go off and do this, though, because I'm willing to try and I'm willing to face the consequences. So my, my advice is, you know, try harder, more, faster. Mm. You know, you can do it. If I can do it, any moron can do it. 
Well, that's great advice to leave our listeners with, uh, Jim. I appreciate your being on the show, and I appreciate the insights that you've brought to us. It's been uh, it's been a great perspective, and it's been uh, something that I think a lot of folks will enjoy hearing and, and, quite frankly, need to hear. Where can our listeners go to get your book and more information about you? Well, uh, the website is school for startups. Dot com. The book is also School for Startups. You buy it on Amazon for 11 bucks, And there's a code in the back that gives you 80 hours of videos of my partner and I talking about everything that we know about entrepreneurship. Um, between the two of us, I think we've started 19 businesses. Um, and we're both, we both were university professors for a while, so we have a lot of content. So for 11 bucks, you can find out every single thing that I've ever had in my brain. That's so, a pretty good deal. Well, you know, they were thinking of charging twelve dollars for it, but they decided <laughs> my brain wasn't worth twelve bucks. So it's eleven dollars worth of information. Um, and you know, I'm on Twitter at Entrepreneur Jim. I'm on LinkedIn, Jim Beach. I connect with everybody. Um, I would love to talk to people. I will give my email address if you would let me. Um, Absolutely. You know, I am James dot beach b e a c h at a t t dot net you hit me up we'll set a time to talk and i'll do anything i can to help you that is quite a generous offer jim and i appreciate your offering that to our listeners anyway for the book it is school for startups dot com and that will be below the show in the link as well as all of the contact information that Jim just gave. Jim, thank you so much for being on the show. I look forward to staying in touch and seeing what awesome things you do next. Likewise, Jeffrey. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on the How to Quit Working Show. Tune in next time when we'll talk to another amazing person just like you who is now living the ultimate life of freedom and doing it on their terms. If you want to learn how to quit working and get these episodes delivered directly to you, visit howtoquitworkingshow.com.